Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode 44, and I have Carvin Wilson, the infamous mead maker, mazer, world traveling mead maker, um, with us tonight, today. And uh, I'm super excited to chat with him. So, Carvin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invite, and um, I'm glad we finally can hook up. Yeah. We, like, so for a little backstory, we've been trying to do a podcast for, I, I think uh, the text I'd sent was back in September of 2021. We tried to, to connect back then. And so about six months later, we're finally able to sit down and it is mostly because you are, um, I mean, you're a big person in the mead making world so much so that like I, uh, two weeks ago, last week, you were in Poland for the European Mead Maker Association stuff, right? Yeah, you know, I was over in Poland uh, right when uh, uh, Russia decided to uh, bomb Ukraine. So that was that was very interesting. But yeah, I was speaking at the European Mead Makers Conference, and I was uh, judging meads at the King of Meads, which is uh, their their uh, you would say the equivalent to their major cup. So some 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 world class meads over there, and had a good time, and look forward to going back next year. That's awesome. I saw some photos. Um, you have an Instagram. And so uh, if anyone wants to find you to, to see some of those photos, um, I'll try and put that down below. But I saw some cool photos and it looked like you guys had a lot of fun. There's a, uh, it is very fun to see that the, the world of mead is not just the US. I feel like sometimes we get so stuck in like what's happening in the US and it's just an expansive thing for us. So it's quite, quite fun. So we were, uh, we've been chasing this rabbit for a long time, finally sitting down, and I want to, I want to start, kind of take it back to the beginning, because I feel like with people knowing who you are, we, we hear about all of your, your accolades and like the things you've done and your big projects. What got you started in the first place with me, making mead? Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell this story again, but you know, it comes from, um, you know, uh, making country wine with my grandfather. And uh, basically, country wine is uh, basically rock cut wine. <laughs> it's, it's horrible wine. Let me, <laughs> let me get fruit and put sugar and put water in it and ferment it as hot as I could. And you know, everything that you're not supposed to do to a ferment beverage. And, you know, so got started with that at an early age. And like I always say, life got in a way you know, went into the Marines, didn't ferment anything for, for a long time, um, you know, established my pro professional career. And then I would say in my late 30s, you know, I really got back into uh, making mead, wine, cider, and, uh, and, you know, and just evolved from there. So I'm 52 now, so, you know, probably a good 22 years hardcore of you know, just fermenting uh, everything that I can to include foods and meats too as well, you know, so oh. I, don't, I don't limit myself to just uh, meat, but uh, I'll, I'll take my hand and try to ferment uh, anything. So I guess you can say it's just in my blood. It's in, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I grew up doing and, you know, I've just been experimenting, you know, uh, for the last 20 something years. Yeah. So at this point, obviously you, you make a lot of mead, you judge mead, those things. Are you also doing beer and wine kind of in tandem? Or are you kind of more mead heavy? Like what's your ratio? To say right now, I'm uh, more beer than I am mead. You know, I, 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 I'm a fermentist. I'm, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll ferment anything, you, you uh -huh. know, you know, you know, yeah, I'm known for my mead. You know, hopefully over the next few years, I'll be I'll be known for my beer and my cider too as well. But you know, my friends all know me for my wine. I've been making wine for 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 a long time. But you know, I'll, I'll make anything. You know, I'm not just one of these people who will just you know make meat all the time. I, you know, I, I like the art of fermentation. Period. Yeah, oh, I I love it too. I think it's super interesting, and and each um, obviously each brew each type of alcohol has its own challenges. And uh, I just live in the mead sphere, obviously. It's having a YouTube channel around it, it kind of makes me uh, have to live in it to make it work. Uh, so you started early on, got back into it. You've been doing it for, for 
two decades now. And uh, when did you first, when was your first, uh, I don't want to say major cup, your first entrance into competitions? Oh, God, probably, you know, I dabbled in those 20 years, you know, nothing, nothing really, uh, I guess you would do major. And I remember one time talking to John Dawkins and, you know, and John, and this is probably about six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, all these folks understand his medals. I was like, Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just go win a whole bunch. (laughs) So, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, to me, it's like, the stuff that I was saying before I got medals, it's the same stuff I say when I got medals, but all of a sudden, you know, people listen, which is, yeah. I just, I just find absolutely stupid, but whatever. That's, that's exactly what happens. So I'm a teacher and I'm a music teacher and I, you know, I teach basic music concepts every day and say the same 27 phrases. And sometimes we'll bring in a, a guest teacher or somebody to a clinic and they'll say, one of those 27 phrases and and my students will be like oh yeah it makes sense now i'm like i've been saying that from the beginning so (laughs) i totally understand and there is a lot of um repeat and a lot of things that uh we understand even without a medal and i love that you said that just because i feel like sometimes we don't listen to people because they don't have a maser cap or because they haven't won an accolade of some sort. There's a lot of good mead that's made that's not entered into competitions, in my opinion. Absolutely. You know, you got to understand, you know, I've had world-class mead that could win any comp. And comps are not for everybody. And you shouldn't, you should be judged on the beverage that you're, you're pouring for someone or the stuff that you're, that you're sharing with folks. Unfortunately, sometimes the audience that you're pouring for don't understand the difference between a Mazer Cup level mead and a uh, and some 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 white pork crappy wine or something of that yeah. of that nature. So you know you 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 got that to deal with, but it's a shame that we as a society and we as a mead community judge people's excellence by not what they put in front of us, but we go by the amount of, oh, they, you know, they won 10 mm. awards. They, they must know what they're doing. Well, you know what? I've, I've, I've had meets from people who won a lot of awards. It still tastes like shit. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, the meat is, I guess, really any fermentation, like you said, fermentation science in general, any brew, unless you've done it three times, four times in a row, and it's had the exact same, result is not necessarily mastered. So that, that one brew that won the medal, you know, if you made it again, it might not be the exact same. So understanding that, uh, there's a lot of trial and error and, uh, and a lot of moving parts that can go wrong (laughs) is, is the first step to like becoming a better mead maker and understanding what can go wrong. Absolutely. But one, one, one thing that's different, you know, and even to a certain degree in beer, but more so in the wine and me, the terroir of my ingredients is, is, is some, you know, that's once in a lifetime, you know, you might not ever be able to duplicate exactly duplicate your world-class orange blossom that you made last year, because guess what? Orange blossom isn't going to be the same. You know, yeah. you know, companies like Walker and Dutch Gold, they do their best job of blending and mixing honeys to get that honey back to where it needs to be. But it might not be the same. It's one of the reasons why, you know, when I find honey that I like, I, I, I buy a lot of it. So if I actually wanted to duplicate that, at least I got a winning shot. But even, even if I bought that honey, honey degrades over time. Yeah. It doesn't spoil, but it's not exactly the same, you know, so there's all kind of variables in there. So Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, you can, you know, you got to have good processes and all that stuff, but sometimes it's, it's hard to repeat. You you can get close, but you know, it's, it's hard to repeat sometimes. Yeah. I, so I, uh, it's fascinatingly enough. I posted a video this week of me making a, a meat recipe from a guy who, He won uh, a gold medal at at the Mazer Cup and a couple other awards. I reached out to him and and bought the exact 
it, not the exact same honey, the same provider of honeys, black locust honey from them. So theoretically it's the same, you know, but because he made his two and a half years ago, the terroir was different then. And so we ended up, it was pretty fun because I made this mead, followed his recipe, followed his process. And of course you can't fix the time aspect, but the flavor profiles are vastly are, are different. And it's a lot and due to just the terroir. And that is, that is super important, like you're saying, for us to uh, remember. It is daunting though. I, I, um, I get overwhelmed when I'm like, oh, I wanna go get this really weird varietal honey. I always will buy like, let's say like three pounds or like maybe a gallon of it and have 12 pounds of it. And then if I like it, I'm like, okay, great. Now I gotta go buy, if I want 60 pounds, I gotta go spend the extra $300 to get it, something like that. So it does become daunting for people. I think that's why a lot of people get scared off of buying, obviously bulk. But if you can do it, definitely do it, I would say. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the honey is just one dimension, you know. Even spices, even fruits are different. Black locust, you, you, know, you must have been taking a recipe from somebody in the Midwest. A lot, <laughs> yeah. a lot of black wolk, locust trees in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a very phenolic menthol-based honey, too, as well. But anywho, you know, there's a lot of variables in that equation when you try to duplicate. And <laughs> I tell people this all the time, you know, uh, I don't have problems sharing recipes because you give you give ten meat makers the same recipe, all of them gonna taste differently because everybody's gonna do something different. Water profile, elevation, pitch rates, you know, uh, vessel size, uh, amount of oxygen. There are so many variables that people mm -hmm. have no idea that you know the dynamics between some of these things. Yeah, I started uh, making meat because it was on the surface, very simple. You know, it was honey, water, yeast, you shake it up and you you let it go, you say, and take do your thing. Now that I'm, I, I'm where I'm at with it, I see all of those variables and I'm like, okay, I got to think about my water chemistry. You know, I got to, what's the pH of this water? Cause that's going to affect it. Or, you know, does it have this or um, have I, did I actually shake it or did I, drill it and get some oxygen in it's it is quite the uh, rabbit hole when you really start going but i think that's what the difference is between beginner mead maker and very successful mead maker is process and how well you actually um, take care of your yeast and your your mead in general so that kind of leads me to my, my first question that we're not going to spend too much time on this tonight, but talking about competitions, what are some of the biggest, most common flaws you find as you are judging meads? Is there, is there one or two that are like, you just are always finding within uh, your competition circuits or? <sighs> I would say no, and it also it depends on the competition, because you know if I go if I go judge a comp in backwoods Alabama where people probably don't know what they're doing and don't really care, uh -huh. yeah, you know a, a comp like that, you know, uh, hot fermentations, not enough nutrients, meats have no balance whatsoever, you know the tannins rip your mouth off. Vice judging something like NHC, you know, you're going to get a little bit better quality of meat, you know, to where, you know, everybody at, you know, normally everybody who's entering a, a bigger comp, you know, uh, the, the Maser Cup, the, the Valkyries, the, the, the NACs, you know, mm -hmm. all the common stuff, they, for the most part, they have uh, they have in check. Uh, I would say the two biggest things I would I would see though would be <laughs> unhealthy yeast. You know, not taking care of yeast. You know, it's just stress yeast, just all kind of bad phenolics and taste from you know either either too hot or not feeding the yeast properly, and um, and then um, balance. Then you know comes to you know, the, the acids, the tannins, the, uh, 
the mouthfeel, the sugars, you know, it's just out of sync and it, and it makes the meat, you know, kind of hard to drink at times. That, that's been a game changer for me personally is um, playing around with balance and really assessing my mead, not from a, uh, from just a, does it taste good to, you know, range to actually asking where is the sweetness compared to the tannin compared to the acidity. And I think what changed my mind or not changed my mind, but helped open my eyes was tasting some commercial meads like Shram's commercial meads and, and people who are, who are doing balance well and going, how did they achieve this? And of course, I'll never know the exact process, but I can, I can A, B in my brain and go, well, man, that's pretty sweet, but it has that tinge of acidity and the tan in here. How can I possibly achieve that in my, whatever I'm making? And it, Obviously, you can do it at home without testing commercial meads, but having a uh, mead to compare it to will make your life better, hopefully. <laughs> you know, it, it, starts, it starts with recipe design, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then it goes all the way through having tools in your toolkits to be able to do acid adjustments, knowing what tannins to use. And then, of course, learning how to blend too, to get that, you know, there, there's so many different ways to achieve, you know, structure. Uh, you know, fermenting with different yeasts, you know, uh, recipe design, all, all kind of different things, you know. You know, me making can be as simple, as complicated as you want it to be. And uh, yeah. if you start going down that, that, that mouthfeel, structure rabbit hole you know you, you can play around with that for years but you know people like ken you know ken has mastered his craft mm -hmm. you know he 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 knows what kind of meats he wants to make and he, he does a damn good job of doing it. yeah i completely agree and um it, it's the people who are listening to this podcast right now or watching it are probably a little more in depth than in desire to be more in depth with their mead making. And they probably have the citric acid and the malic acid, you know, ready to go. Uh, a lot of people I experience, because I, I feel like I see a spectrum of them on YouTube, are of the mindset that they want it to be as simple as possible. So anything beyond honey, water, yeast, and maybe nutrients is, is too far. And I can personally relate because when I first started, I, I didn't want to brew beer because I required a bunch of ingredients. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to buy like seven or eight things. Like that is just way too much stuff. So I found mead and I was like, oh, it's three things. I just throw it together. Obviously, we know it's more than that now. But the more things you have makes it more complicated. And um, I think a lot of people don't end up tasting meads outside of their own. So they don't ever really know if theirs is good or bad compared to other people. Yeah. Most amateur meat makers think that they're the world's best meat maker and they're just blinded to their own Kool-Aid mm -hmm. and the people around them who have no idea how to give them constructive feedback beyond, Oh, this is good. Oh yeah. This is not that bad, you know, but, they, they don't know how to communicate back to that person that gave them that meat, what they're tasting anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, you do get a lot of uh, blinded by your own Kool-Aid syndrome in the amateur mead world. And <laughs> it's kind yeah. of funny. Yeah. And I see it. I mean, we all have friends that we share mead with and they're most of my friends I give mead to are, um, are free booze takers. You know, you give it to them and it could be, you know, a three out of 10 mead. And they'd be like, this is good. Thank you. This is, you know, like they just free booze. Here we go. Um, and then there are a select few people in my little sphere that I can take something to and say, please roast this or please critically give some feedback to. And those are the people that I, I really trust for opinions. I'm going to share with my free booze friends because I want to share mead, but I'm going to take the, the real criticism from the people who are, uh, actually giving real criticism, not just what you want to hear. Absolutely. And, you know, and even when it comes to criticism, you got to understand that that's their take on the beverage too, as well. 
and, and, and you got to take it as constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's palate is different. Everybody's perception of your meat is going to get is going to be different. That's why entering entering meats in the comps and 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 seeing how it does over five or six comps, you know, that that gives your uh, gives you a little bit better, uh, you know. I guess you would say overview of how that, how well that mead is crafted. Yeah. I, I can definitely attest to having submitted a mead to only one competition and um, well, I've submitted to multiple, but in this instance, I submitted a single brew to one competition and that was the only feedback I got. And those judges at that time, they didn't rate it super high. They didn't, it's just middle ground, you know? And to me, it was very good. And to my friends, if I had more bottles and shared it with, a couple other competitions, then you can, of course, you know, side by side them and, and see the parallels. But uh, that's, that's hard for people who don't brew past a gallon. <laughs> you gotta, you know, then you're like, you're giving away all your bottles except for one of them. So that's, that is a, a goal for me is to make bigger batches of com competition meads so that I can actually uh, do more with them at some point, but it takes more space. That's the only problem that it does so all right so let's talk about kind of switching gears a little bit within your own mead making process um are you more of a well i guess you could use any of these but do you spend more time using for made o or k or dimonium phosphate like what's your your yeast nutrient that you probably use the most at this point obviously some are situational but well, they, they all are situational. And, yeah. and, he, and before I even go down this rabbit hole, mm -hmm. uh, what folks don't understand is that you have to practice your craft. You just can't go keep Googling on the internet and seeing what everybody else is doing, and listening to podcasts and seeing what everybody else is doing. Because let me tell you something. There's a lot of high-level meat makers out there who ain't never going to tell you what they're doing. And you're gonna have to find out on their own. They got right. they got they got public stuff that they say, but it's kind of like getting grandma's chocolate chip cookie recipe. You ain't never gonna get it all. You might you might get the last piece when she's on her deathbed. So, <laughs> you no, know, it really depends. It, it really depends on what I'm doing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. If I'm gonna front load a meat, and for right now I've been front loading anything you know eight percent below mm -hmm. i use firm a i use firm 80 uh there was there was a there was a time where i used all firm 80 but now i've i've switched to a combination of firm 80 dap and uh and, and uh firm k you know mm -hmm. so you know it it just really depends and i say this because it's just one of those things you have to practice you have to make that me make that blueberry me with firm eight oak, make it with firm K and DAP, make it with firm K DAP and firm O, and see which one you like the best. Yeah. You know? So and and sometimes that thing called life just gets in the way too, where I wanted to 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 use all three, but you know what? I got called away on a business meeting, and I don't trust my wife to feed the me. <laughs> Dap, so you know, I I'll change it on the fly. You know, so uh -huh. it, it it just really depends. But I would say for the most part, you know, the answer to the question, if it's eight percent or below, I'm using uh, Firm Eight O right now. Mm -hmm. If I'm making a, a a big, you know, fruit meat or making a big sweet sack meat, I'm using K Dap Anno. So um, I'm sure you you've heard about this the whole dimonium phosphate up to 9%, like, and then past 9%, there's a yeast don't um, metabolize it as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I only bring that up because um, I, I use Fermato pretty much all the time too. Uh, but if you're doing something that is above 9%, are you step feeding with DAP? early on or are you going dap all the way to the end like mixed in to use dap early on in the process and then okay. oh uh uh toward toward the the end but 
you know, I think at this point, you know, folks, folks are so glued in on calculators <laughs> these days. Yeah. I, you know, talk about flaws that I'm starting to see a lot. You know, not a lot of people eat nutrients, but I do from time to time. And I can taste those nutrients in folks' meats. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm convinced that a lot of meat makers are overfeeding their meats. You know, you got people like Tom and myself who have equipment that, you know, we measure the yin in our, in our batch because, you know, we want to, you know, be better meat makers. And you'll be surprised, you know, when you start to add fruit mm-hmm. into meats, you know, how little yin you need. Yeah, and I did. I did. I did uh, raspberry meat uh, uh, probably about two years ago, and I, I must have measured the yen about five or six times because when I because I didn't believe it, you know, I was already at two hundred and sixty parts per million. Uh, so you were you were well you. Uh, you know, I I I didn't I didn't add I didn't add yeah. anything. I, I rehydrated the yeast uh, with. Uh, with go firm, you know, because that's just a smart thing to do when you're making a big fruit mead like that. And uh, actually, these are black raspberries. Let me clarify that. And, uh, you know, like on day day four, I added probably, I would say, less than a fourth of what most people would add of uh, uh, fermato to that batch, and that's all. I, it, that's all it needed. Uh huh. So how? Uh, I honestly don't know the answer to this. How do you? How do you? Or what are you using to measure your, yeah, content of your brew? Well, for me, uh, because I like my toys, I have a CDR wine lab. Uh, okay. So that's 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 what most wineries use. So you got an extra ten grand laying around. You can buy one of those. But, uh, yeah, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, there there's other low cost options. Uh, yeah, you know, you 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 could, you could probably get into the, uh, I think the Trimeca. Uh, I think that little Ventrometrica. They have they have like a a, a yen add on, and you know, like you can get into that like three four hundred dollars. You know, but, okay. You know, with my device, I can do multiple samples at a time. And, you know, uh, back when I bought that unit, I was doing a lot of research uh, mm-hmm. on different things. And uh, it, uh, it's, it's paid for itself. Yeah. Well, and I think that um, you, you've brought up the issue at hand, and that is mo- mostly that people don't necessarily always have the utility or understand. Like, I honestly have never. Um, looked at that equipment and I've been making mead for now five years and I've done 200 batches and whatnot. And so I, I have a hard time believing that somebody who's like four batches in is going to look at that thing and go, or look at a, a tool like that and go, all right, I'm ready. You know what I mean? So uh, I think that's probably the biggest issue at hand. And that's why people lean so much on calculators is because theoretically someone has done the work to tell you how much to add but I do think you're right there. Uh, we can't appropriately use a calculator to tell us how much yen is found in our raspberry, you know, and it's terroir and all the other things we talked about. But so then people just kind of go based off of what does that got me calculator tell me to put in. All right, here we go. And uh, you're right about that. I think the calculators do give you a good baseline. But here's what I've seen a lot of people do. They Americanize it. Or they'll, or they'll pull the old Texas big old scoop. Well, you know, I said it. I, I know it said one gram, but two grams must be better. I'm going to throw two. I, I've talked to so many people sometimes. Like I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it, said, it said one gram. Well, you know, I figured, you know, no, don't figure. Just don't, don't do that. You know, it's a, just the American motto. More yeah. must obviously be better. But, yeah. you know, then you get this kind of medicinal phenolic taste in your mead that's just kind of out of place. Mm-hmm. A lot of people say that uh, I have no, no truth to this, so a disclaimer. 
I don't know if this is true. People say that for a made O, um, when unused, does not necessarily do anything. But I don't know that that's true. I, I believe that it still mixes into the brew. You know, it's still a powder that is going to get concentrated. So I would, that's part of my, um, the fun for me for YouTube is that one day I'll do a test on that. I will, you know, take and put four times the amount of Fermate O I need in, and then, you know, one time and two times and kind of see if I can taste it. But that's, that is a statement I've heard previously is that Fermate O is not as easily tasted. I say those people are full of shit. <laughs> yeah. That's just my take on that. I tell them to take a teaspoon of Fermate O and put it in their next glass of mead mm -hmm. and uh, tell me what they think. Yeah. Or, you know, I can taste it. Yeah. Now, every, now, different people have different thresholds of taste. You know, you know I've, been, I've been drinking or tasting Fermate O and firm AK, and I like to do it before comps too. Like if mm -hmm. I know I'm going to a comp, I like to refresh myself with flavor flavor profiles. And one of the things I do is drink a little bit firm O mixed with hot water and a little okay. bit firm, firm K mixed with hot water. And I'll throw a little dap of dab on my tongue. You don't want to be making a drink full of dap. <laughs> Yeah, not, please, please not, note, please <laughs> note. <laughs> I'm not looking to go to ER, but I'll take a little bit and put on my tongue, you know, stuff like that. Even even go for him, you know, I'll, I'll try to do stuff like that. Yeah. You know, but, but, but also, you know, <laughs> all you ever hear is Firm 8 Firm 8K, you know, DAP, you know, whatever. There's a lot of different companies who make a lot of different mm -hmm. yeast, uh, uh, yeast and yan uh, uh, tools uh, uh -huh. out there. Uh, so people, once again, people got to use their do their research. You know, you know, you said Fermato, Firm AK, and that. I use products like that, and I don't even want to get into it. But mm -hmm. I, I use completely different vendors that everybody else uses because if I want to make a beverage that is different than everybody else, consuming the same information. Guess what? Mm -hmm. I should probably use different stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the reasons why I rarely, right now, make a mead with yeast that anybody probably has even heard of mm -hmm. because I am trying to do something different. I'm not trying to do what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Well, so that was going to be one of my next questions. Obviously, you kind of spoiled it, but... Um... I'm not going to not going to make you say all the the yeast cuz then you know obviously people will start flocking to those and I don't want to uh, um I don't want to spoil your secrets unless you're unless you're wanting to but what are some of the yeast that we might know um that you have enjoyed using previously do you have a few are you like a are you a D47 guy are you a Premier Rouge guy you know Obviously I'm, situational I'm sorry uh, Yeah I'm I'm a big fan of uh, folks trying to use as many yeast as they humanly possibly can. I'm a big fan of D21, D80, D254, uh, uh, Rome 4600, uh, 71B, EC1118. People give that yeast a bad name. You know what? They just don't know what the hell they're doing. That's that's the problem. You, know, you got to ferment low, and you know that yeast can create some magical stuff you know, in the right hands, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people give that yeast a bad name. I, lo I love Q823 too as well. I love DV10. You mm -hmm. know, so, and, and also, I, I love to, uh, you know, a lot of people just make yeast with, make a meat with one, uh, one yeast. You know, mm -hmm. I rarely make a meat with one yeast. I'll yeah. split the batch and ferment it with three different yeasts, then blend them back together. That's cool. Each, yeah. each yeast is going to bring something different to the party. Uh huh. Yeah. That and I, I've heard of people. I haven't personally done that too much, um, but I have. I have a whole series of videos where I've done one recipe with different yeasts, and um, they currently are just setting, waiting to be tasted again. But that is that seems like a really fun idea to to compare and contrast and get different elements and. It's almost like a no-brainer, but I feel like people get scared off of it because they don't 
they don't feel the need to or don't know how to do it. And um, I, I talked about this in a previous podcast, but, you know, we, we have the kind of killer strain idea um, with yeast in that obviously some are more dominant than others. So when you are, you just talked about blending the finished batches. Have you ever made a, a two yeast brew that was in the same brew? You know what I mean? Have you spent time doing that? Well, because I think it defeats the purpose. Huh. You know, I, I would never pitch two yeast in the same fermentation. That's why you split the fermentation. You know, one of those yeasts is going to take over. Yeah, and that's that's what I mean. Is that killer strain? There's some that are not killer strains, and that pair well together. I don't have a list. I don't know for sure, but um, I, I really like your idea of, of uh, blending. That's making my wheels turn. Like, what can I do now? I got I got a bunch of yeast sitting over here. What can I do to uh, mix and match and and mess around with that. Um, have you, are you uh, spending much time using uh, more beer graded yeast? I know you listed some numbers earlier, but I don't, I'm not familiar to the point with each one of them. Do you use a lot of uh, Belgian wheat, wit beers or uh, yeast or anything like that at this point? Or are you mainly in the wine land? You know what? Uh, I, I do. And I would like to credit, uh... Tony Qualls from Manic and uh, Billy Betts from Lost Cause. Now, those two guys really opened my eyes to, uh, you know, using beer yeast uh, and uh, fermentation. So, yeah, I do. I still use wine yeast a lot, but, you know, I've started to play around with a lot of beer yeast. And you know what? I really like the results. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm working on my kind of one of my continual goals is this apple and cinnamon 8% brew. I just want to get it down as well as I can. And um, I think my next phase is, is yeast trials and just really taking that same recipe and putting it through four different yeasts and, you know, just kind of seeing what happens uh, because obviously they bring different things to the table, but one of them, one of the yeasts I'm going to use is, is in that beer family. And I'm hoping to get some different profiles. I do know that in my experience, it's a lot of fun to experiment with those beer yeast because we, we run away from them because we hear, oh, it's a beer yeast. Like, obviously, it's not going to get what I want out of it. I think that's totally opposite. I feel like beer yeast sometimes are exactly what you need. Those profiles are exactly what you need for the brew you're going for. So, go ahead. Sorry. Let me cut you off. Oh, I just said I agree. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. Okay, so, um, now that kind of takes us into our um, recipe development we you talked about it earlier and um i think you would be a great guy to speak into someone like me and everyone listening when you're developing recipes what are some things you are considering obviously there are let's say you're wanting to make a peach mellow mel and you know with vanilla are you um I guess, how do you develop a recipe for something in general? Oh, I would say my approach is probably a, 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 a little bit non-traditional. You know, I, I, I like to, well, I have a whole library of honeys, first of all. Mm -hmm. And so we'll start with that aspect. You know, I'll start eating that, that fruit, those peaches with honey and add vanilla in them and stuff like that. Start eating it with ice cream. You know, mm. just, just start getting a flavor. What types of peaches do I want to use? Do I want to use one peach? Do I want to use three different types of peaches? Do I want to do the skins? Do I want to do this? Then I'll move on to teas and honey mm. and spices and, 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 and go from there because uh, that's a very underutilized technique too as, as well as uh, uh, using steep tea for some of these uh, aromatics and, and, and mead. So I'll start drinking teas with those honeys and those fruits. Then, you know what? I'll move on to slushies. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start making slushies with, with uh, peaches. And it's like, okay, that, that'll that help me narrow down even, even more. Then on top of that, you know, I rely on my practice and my experience from using yeast over the last 20 years to select – what yeast I want to use for these. And then once I get to that point, 
you know, I will then start with some small one gallon batches. Mm -hmm. uh, the one gallon batches, you know, I'll do with some of the type top yeast and I'll start doing yeast trials and just keep playing around. You know, so many people just want to just go get a recipe off the internet and just do it and don't want to do any work. It's work mm -hmm. to compose a award winning recipe. Mm -hmm. You know, as you can see, you know, I, I take a lot of different steps before I'm ready to even make the meat. Yeah. So it, it could be weeks before I'm ready to make the meat. You know, it, it could just be narrowing down what kind of peaches and honey that I want to use. Yeah. And I, I definitely for a new brewer, that's it's a daunting task. But, uh, well, I say it's daunting. It just takes more planning. And you're right. I, as somebody who has a YouTube channel where I am promoting recipes and things, um, a lot of people will come to my video for that recipe. And my hope is that I've, I've done it well enough to at least give them a starting point. Again, hearkening back to the fact that whatever that person makes, even if it's down to the exact ounce of honey, gram of fermate O and water, whatever, it's going to be different. Um, they, they want that simple, simple thing. And it's not simple as, and I hope that anyone listening is not uh, overwhelmed by that. I, I feel like it can be discouraging for some people to hear that um, really good mead requires work, but I think that's the truth of it. It's, it's not, it's not just to throw it all together. It's a recipe development. It's a eat peaches outside of the, outside of um, just making mead kind of situation. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, for me, you know, everybody's approach is different. Now, I don't want simple. I want memorable. I want you to remember my meat two years down the road. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember the last time I had a sip of that. I want every sip to be memorable. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with just, you know, creating a meat and carving it up and putting it on top, you know. But I'm past that. I'm trying to create memories. Yeah. So how do you suggest – when uh, obviously developing, but balancing acid, um, what is your method for, for testing different acids in, in your balancing process? Um, well, once again, first of all, I got equipment to do that. And, and depending on how you want to get, you know, you can do that, but it, it comes to doing acid trials. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll do acid trials, but it also starts with recipe design. Mm -hmm. You know, if I know that I'm using a highly acidic fruit, I know I got to have a certain amount of sweetness to balance that out. Yeah. You know, and, and I also know that I'm going to need some tannins because nobody just wants mouth puckering, you know, acids too as well. So it, it comes from recipe design. And then having tools, once again, having tools in your toolkit to know that, I can adjust the acid, I can adjust the tannins, and I can also blend and back sweeten to get, you know, the taste profile that I'm looking for. So it just it just comes down to practice. And your so your acid trials to me that means taking a, a glass of mead or three glasses of mead, let's say, or multiple, getting a, a sample of your brew that you're attempting to balance and putting um, X amount of citric in this one, and X amount of malic and X amount of tartaric, and then doing smaller amounts or whatever to, to calculate or figure out which one's best. Is that, that the process you're looking at too? Absolutely. And uh, I know there's a document on the modern meat makers about it. Uh, I forget the gentleman name. I know Jeremy Volts did one, but you know, that'd be, that'd be a great podcast for you to do for yourself, you know, to, you and two friends or three friends sit there and do acid trials. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of it, I'm it's happy to see that a lot of meteries, commercial meteries are doing acid trials because you know, it really does make a difference. It, it mm -hmm. can, it can give a meat a little bit more pop, but you know, it's, it's just one of those things you just need to have in your toolkit. If you are planning to uh, enter some meats in the comps. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my story for that is I, my apple cinnamon meat I've been working on, um, I, this last time I did it, I kegged it and I took it over to my friend BC and, um, uh, he tasted it and he was like, you know what? I think this needs just 
a small amount of citric acid. And so he pulled out his stuff and sprinkled some in. And it was, it took that brew from what was, let's say a, a 75 to immediately to like a 90, just by one pinch of citric acid. And of course, you know, his knowledge of knowing which acid is helpful, but more importantly, one small change changed the whole profile in, in a positive light. And so those acid trials, while daunting to start doing, are also so beneficial. And uh, I remember I've done it with a couple brews now. And it is, it's really fun. And it, it definitely challenges your palate. But this is, this is all palate um, ex- expansion, palate learning to develop your palate in the world. So I guess that kind of leads to my next question. Other than obviously tasting a bunch of mead and things, do you have any tips or tricks? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, water and fermato and that stuff for developing that, that side of the palate. Do you have any tricks for developing the palate for mead making outside of that stuff? I say this one a lot, you know, if, if you want to be a good golfer, you got to go golf. You got to go to range and hit balls. Yep. If you want to be good at softball, you got to go to the batting cage. Mm-hmm. If, if you want to be a well-rounded meat maker and be able to pick up, you know, different taste profiles, you have to experiment with those taste profiles, but also you need to stop drinking your own Kool-Aid and go drink other meat. You know, you, you got the practice. You know, you you got to know what meats taste like. And one of the best things you can do, people always like, well, I don't have any money. Well, go judge a large comp. Pay the airfare in a hotel. You could you could taste 100, 200 meats in a weekend that yeah. you didn't have to pay for. You know, uh-huh. being a judge is the perfect way to taste a lot of meads in a very compact short of time. It's one of the reasons I became a judge. Like, <laughs> you know, when, when, you know, it's the best R I tell people it's the best R and D sessions you'll ever get for free. And uh-huh. people are sending, sending you meads to try and you get to try them, you know? So being a judge is a great R and D session and it gives you a lot of exposure to a lot of different meads. And sometimes as a judge, you'll say, you know what? I don't like the execution that this person did, but I can see the potential and, if this was me, you know, Mm -hmm. with a few modifications to as well. So you got to practice. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're, you're perfectly segue segueing into um, one of my last little questions I have slash I'm sure I'll come up with another one because I, I enjoy (laughs) where we're going, but in the mead competition sphere, obviously when you're judging um, every single mead is when you're submitting is put into a category of course this is not news to you this is just news to everyone who's listening uh as a judge when you are trying let's say a uh a whatever a mellow mel and let's say a stone fruit mellow mel category and they label it in the sweet category but it tastes dry. Is there a world where you like, as a judge, do you, um, how do you handle that situation whenever a judge, a meat is mislabeled by the creator? For me, it has to be blatant. Like if you put dry and it's like diabetes sweet, (laughs) because I, I say this to folks all the time, you don't have a refractometer. Right. on your tongue. I think people are too nitpicky about sweetness levels in my opinion. And it got to be blatant for me. It's like some, something that I rarely pay attention to as a judge. There's mm-hmm. two things I rarely pay attention to as a judge. Clarity, uh-huh. which I think is bullshit. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and sweetness level. Uh-huh. You know, I look for everything that is right in a me. And when you're doing that, the wrong just gets in the way of what you're looking at Mm. and somebody writing on a score sheet, you know, uh, this was 0.032 sweet. Mm. I say those people are just full of crap. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I mean, I definitely think that that is outlandish. And and my only question is I just, um, you know, where we have our own meat competition myself and, and doing the most that we do. And so we're, 
you know, learning the ropes when it comes to those things. And so that was just a, a question I, uh, I was thinking about, you know, what do you do when there is a, a miscategorization categorization of a brew? And so then that kind of goes to the next thing. Let's say that that person labeled it as a raspberry mellow mail. I know only because I've, I've spent time studying for the BJCP and re- read the whole big article and, you know, done the study guide that the, the fruit while being labeled should not, uh, you, you should not be punishing the person if it is not extreme raspberry. You know what I mean? If it's a different shade of raspberry or if it's whatever that the, the raspberry flavor should not be the, uh, that the strength of it should not determine the score necessarily, if that makes any sense. Would you agree with that completely or is that, am I off, off basis? Yes and no. And I just want to go back and touch just a little bit on, uh, on the last question before uh-huh. I, I uh, do this one. Now let's say they entered it as dry and it's, and it's, and it's just diabetes sweet and it was a good meat. Uh-huh. I was still a great score mm-hmm. and then I asked the organizer, I'm like, you know, Hey, do you want to move this on or not? Mm. Nine times out of 10, they're going to say no. And mm. then you just write on a score sheet, you know, awesome me, but couldn't advance because, you know, the sweetness level was wrong. If it was me, I would just, I would just move it on, you know? Yeah. Uh, now to answer your question about, about fruit, there's two things I want to add. Sometimes when people, let's just say, do your raspberry meat, but, you know, you're getting cherry, pomegranate, and some other stuff in there, you know, you'll get people who's like saying that, oh, this should have been in the melomel. No, you know, there's just expression from yeast and fermentation mm-hmm. sometimes that give that meat extra aromatics and it gives it different taste profile. So, you know, once again, you know, you're, you're, you're not the judge and executioner of mm-hmm. uh, aromatics and taste profile. Now, if you're doing a raspberry mead and I can't get any kind of expression of raspberry and I'm just getting nothing, uh-huh. you know, that's not, that mead is not going to make it to the next round because right. you're going to have better raspberry mead. <laughs> at a competition. That's going to sort itself out because if you put this little lowly, lacking fruit raspberry mead on a table with 10 berry bombs or well-executed mead, that thing's not going to stand out. So you as a mead maker need to think about that before you enter that into a comp. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, you know, part of my, um, like I said, part of my questioning is, is just as I develop as a mead maker and judge, like, I'm working my own palate and and perspective on creating these meads. There is a lot, like you mentioned, a lot of um, yeast derived profiles that, that can be mistaken for other things. And, you know, I had a, um, I just had a great chance to have my friends taste a bunch of traditional meads I made. And a few of them, they're like, this is uh, mango blossom honey, but it has, this one has like a berry note and it tastes like a blueberry note. And of course I had no intentionality of adding blueberry to this thing. It was mango honey. You know, there was no, no essence at all, but my yeast had created or had uh, whatever word I'm looking for inserted some sort of blueberry phenolic and flavor profile aroma to it that made it more interesting. Um, like you said earlier, the power of yeast, go and try some different yeast. Don't get stuck with the same two. Cause you'll, you'll uh, never really progress as a, a mead maker. If you do that. And one thing to add on there, you know, there's, you know, when you're making as much meat as Ken and Fairbrother and Tony and Billy and some of these guys, they can't take those chances. Mm-hmm. They got to pay the bills. So they're going to stick with what they know is going to work for them. But guess what? they know what's going to work from them for the years they spend practicing before they became a, a a professional me maker. This is your chance to explore the world. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, this is your chance to go on your walk about and try as many yeasts as you want. Yeah. Especially if you're thinking about going pro. 
Exactly. I was about to say that. If you are looking to, the best time to do any experimentation is when you can do it freely, <laughs> like you're saying. All right. So I got, uh, I, I don't want to honor your time. So I don't want to take up all your night because I know you got things to do. So I got two more quick questions. First one, you talked about having some equipment to be able to measure, you know, acidity to measure pretty much everything you need in your world. When you are dealing with um, SO2 levels, are you, uh, obviously you're, you're able, I'm assuming you're able to measure your SO2 levels within your brew. Am, am I am. Okay. How would you suggest for somebody like myself or somebody who does not have the equipment to do so, um, how would you suggest we go about dealing with that SO2 uh, problem, I'll say? When it comes to uh, there's some standard calculations out there. I know Modern Meat Makers has a good one. Uh, I would say you know one thing to keep in mind: anytime you're moving your meat or you're agitating it, you know, free SO2 becomes bound. So, mm. like when I have a lot of meats that I'm working on, you have to go through and I check those SO2 levels. You know, probably every two months, and guess what? They go down. So I got to mm. re I got to readjust those SO2 levels to in, in those beads. So that's one thing to think about. Now, you're working in such small quantities. I doubt that they're going down that much. But, you know, if, if you're moving around, going in there, taking sippy sips and stuff like that, realize, you know, some of your free SO2 is going to be bound that you might have to resolve like that meat again. Yeah. And that's something that um – uh, a lot of people are scared of sulfites, as we know. They're scared of sorbate and sulfite. Those, those two things are kind of spooky <laughs> for lots of people. I'm personally not afraid of them. But when you are able or willing to add those sulfites in and adjust those SO2 levels, I feel like people – I know that people will see a big difference in their brew, especially when it term, comes to aging long-term. We all want that – uh, mead that we can drink in 10 years, but without the proper execution, that mead's not going to be drink drinkable in 10 years. Um, I think that's, that's kind of important for people to remember. Yeah. yeah um, you know, but there's also a flip side to that. There's, there's, there's some people who don't, don't solve fight, but their sugar level and their alcohol level is high enough to where, you know, it kind of acts as a preservative. Yeah. So. That's, I have a, um, I made a anniversary mead for my, my wife and I, and the intent was to get at least 25 bottles and age it for 25 years, you know, and drink a bottle at every anniversary. And of course, uh, you know, I was looking at SO2 levels and then I was mainly looking at, okay, well, what's my alcohol going to be and what's my final gravity, you know, how much sugar is going to be left in that mead's pretty sweet and it's pretty high ABV in hopes that it will um, age a little bit longer. Uh, I don't know. It's it's going to be a very fun test to see what that's like in five years. It's going to age well for you. I sure no, hope so. And, uh, <laughs> there, there's so many people in the meat community that deal in absolutes. that uh -huh. it, just, it just hurts my head sometimes to even get on the farms. You know, there, there's more than one way to do things. Mm-hmm. And people should stop dealing in absolutes. There's 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 people who don't self fight their meat, and that's okay. That's their thing, and and and, and it should be respected. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't want to ever, um, I don't ever want to pit people against each other, you know, and say that there. I don't think there should be two sides of mead making. I think we should all just be in that same camp of mead makers, with maybe a little different process. But I feel like. Um, and I've already expressed it in, in, a, in a video and things, but there's, there's two sides of the mead community. We've got our natural and we've got unnatural. And those, those two people, those two camps kind of wage war sometimes with each other, especially I see it a lot in YouTube comments. You know, there's a lot of people who we got warriors on each side. So. You know what, you know, I, I, I tell folks, you know, you know, I'm the, I'm the admin of the modern meat makers group. The, the title says it all. It's modern me making. Nothing's stopping them from doing a naturopathic mead group. And you can promote your way of making mead all you want, but you shouldn't come on a modern me making channel or a modern me making group and tell us, you know, 
that, you know, that, you know, the Viking way is better. You know what? If you gave a Viking a choice between a spear and an M16, he's going to choose the <laughs> M16 every time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I can totally agree. Oh man. That's a great, that's a great example. I've always tried to find, you know, I, I always use the example of, you know, faster, better, cleaner fermentation versus slower, unpredictable, but that's, that's much better. I, I might have to steal that for, for future, uh, future, future use. So my last question for you, I always like to ask this for, from people or for people. Um, if you had any advice to give to somebody who's either just starting out or, you know, really maybe just kind of taking the next steps with mead making, what are some things you wish you had, you had known earlier on? Um, there's a few things, but I'm going to start off with the one that I tell people the most. Don't forget to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't have to be all complicated. Uh, two, try to enjoy other meads and go judge competitions so you can sample meads, and that's going to turn a lot of light bulbs on for you. Uh, three, make smaller batches, <laughs> especially <laughs> until you know what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with, you know, everybody get the glamour shots of the five gallon, 20 gallon batches with fruit. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with cutting your teeth on some smaller batches. And mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to uh, experiment with stuff a, a, a lot quicker. And uh, three, decide what kind of meat maker, uh, I guess we're on four, is decide what kind of meat maker you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just a casual meat maker, what do you care, <laughs> you know, about entering your meat into a comp? And there's a lot of casual meat makers out there, you know. Mm -hmm. I meet so many people sometimes and say, hey, you know, I'm never going to enter a comp, you know, blah, 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 you know. So I don't see the reason to do this or do that. And I'm like, you know, you're right. You don't have to do that, mm -hmm. you know. It, it, you know, I talked to a guy the other day. He's like, you know what, I don't soft like my meats because – you know, we drink them in like less than three weeks. I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> kudos, kudos yeah. to you, you know, but he makes a one gallon batch and, you know, he got, and he has a lot of people who enjoy his meads. And I'm like, if it's working for you, don't do it, you know, do it. And, 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 and the last thing is steer clear of people who deal in absolutes, only mm -hmm. sis deal in absolutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's more than one way to do something is mm -hmm. just because someone, just because the person you're talking with might not know or might not have heard of it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant. There, there's so many things that I do that I don't tell folks because I just don't even feel like having a discussion. With them. So, yeah, well, I think those are all great. And I, um, I completely agree. I think at the end of the day, it's kind of going back to your point, number one, this is a this is a hobby for about ninety nine percent of the population of people making mead, and within that, that means that we we get to have fun with it. And I say get to because so many meaderies right now are thinking we have to make money. That you know we got to make it till till six months from now, but we we get to just make it for fun. And if we want to go further and competitions and meteries those are our own personal choices but uh hearkening back let's have fun with this and and look at the multitude of ways that we can make this product in anything we want so carvin thank you so much for your time this has been a blast and i uh, i've always uh, ever since i got into mead making you know i heard your name and it is extremely surreal for me to, to be able to sit here and chat with you. Um, so it's been a real honor. And I'm, I'm just thankful that you would spend a, an hour of your time with me um, chatting about all of this stuff. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Garrett. And uh, hey, I'm, I, I'll come on anytime if we can, if we can arrange it. <laughs> oh, I, I sure, I think we can. I, we'll make it work again. It, it might be six months from now, but we will, we will make it work. Um, if you would like to, uh, I'm, I'm going to plug the Modern Bead Makers Facebook group because I know you're a, a um, admin 
I think it's admin on there. I don't know if the moderator is the term anyways, but you, you're on there lots. And so, um, you might be able to catch Carvin when he gets some free time and, and a comment uh, over on there. But I also know that you have um, the Mead Institute, which I want to make sure and plug that as well. That's another um, great thing happening kind of behind the scenes with Carvin. Um, I talked with Frank Golbeck about it uh, last podcast episode, if you would like to listen and hear more about that. But um, Carvin's a, a well-renowned mead maker, and I, I think everybody listening should run forward with with his, with his advice and, uh, and and go and make some more mead. So thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, I will see you next time. <laughs> yeah, man.